Welcome to the part four of the International Christian University Linguistic Colloquium, uh, as known as ICU Link. I'm Sung Hun Lee from ICU, and uh, the topic of ICU Link this season is African linguistics. Today we have two talks by uh, Ken Safaya from uh, Rutgers University and Claire Halpert from University of Minnesota uh, sharing their talk. So let me first introduce uh, the speaker. Ken uh, is a distinguished professor of linguistics at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. He received his PhD in linguistics from MIT. His research interests are in uh, syntactic theory, binding theory, Germanic and African linguistics. And he's running the uh, long project, uh, the Afrina project uh, that develops uh, descriptions of a wide range of African languages. Uh, so we know more uh, through this language about uh, uh, linguistics series or like the nature of language uh, using empirical uh, data. Uh, I think uh, when I was at Rutgers when you first started uh, the project in 2003 and it was also when uh, World Congress of African Linguistics was held uh, at uh, Rutgers so that's like my second year in PhD or first year between the first and second year, so long time ago. <laughs> and uh, the project is still running and actually uh, contributing to, to our understanding of uh, some intricate part of the grammar in African languages that uh, are not uh, readily available in many languages. So, um, uh, <clears throat> so I actually uh, suggest uh, if you are interested in uh, going to this uh, website later on, not during the talk, uh, uh, and here's the link to the AFRINAP uh, uh, database. So uh, <laughs> on a personal note, uh, as you probably just guessed, uh, Ken was uh, uh, my professor, a syntax professor at uh, Rutgers. Uh, and also we met at multiple conferences after I uh, graduated from Rutgers. And it's very good uh, to have you here today. And we look forward to hearing about complementizer agreement with superordinate subjects in Setswana and Ikalanga. Okay, uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, okay, I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, let's see, make sure we get the right one. Uh, let's see. Sorry, it took me a minute to get the right window. Oh, I had it all lined up here. I'm not happy to it. <clears throat> Sorry a second, I'm going to have to uh, <laughs> do a thing or two to get this ready. Okay, no problem. <laughs> uh, thought I had it all lined up. Okay, I think I do now. Okay, uh, can you see that now? Yes, we can see. It. Yeah. All right. Thank okay. you. Okay, then I'll start. All right, so today I'm going to talk about this particular kind of complement uh, clause complementizer agreement. That's a you know a lot of words in the mouth. So uh, CCC complement clause complementizer. Okay, and then another. Uh, <clears throat> Mouthful is uh, immediately superordinate clause, uh, which I'm going to call ISOC. And I'll, I'll try to make it uh, integrate the two from uh, uh, so that you can get used to using those uh, and understanding what they are. Uh, but eventually, essentially, this, this is a talk about uh, a class of complementizers uh, in African languages uh, and some languages, African languages that have this phenomenon where we see the complementizer of a complement clause agreeing not with, say, the local subject of the uh, subordinate clause, as you see in some European languages, but it agrees instead with the uh, matrix subject of the verb that takes that clause as a complement. Okay, uh, And so it's the immediate superordinate clause subject that the uh, uh, complementizer of the complement agrees with. Okay, I'll show you an example in a minute or two. Um, and uh, it's a rather interesting uh, relationship because there's gotta be some syntactic connection that permits that agreement. And uh, since it's not 
uh, in, in some sense, it's not so local. In other ways, it is local. And we'll talk about those relationships and how this could possibly be um, uh, analyzed in terms of the, the theoretical uh, tools that we have. Okay. Now, within Africa, <clears throat> it's not uh, uh, terribly uh, rare to come across this, especially in, uh, in Bantu languages of the uh, uh, Western and Southern uh, uh, Bantu uh, areas, but it's also found maybe by loan, maybe not. And uh, uh, in, uh, I think one now Saharan language and uh, also in West Africa, it's been tested there too. And you see a list there of um, a number of the papers that have been uh, uh, written about this. It all basically started uh, to get into general discussion with uh, Kawash's paper in 2007. Uh, and since then, a number of people worked on it. Uh, perhaps the most detailed uh, account is uh, Michael Dirks's work on uh, Lupacusu, um, which uh, uh, I may have occasion to refer to once or twice. Uh, I've also been working on this with uh, my colleague uh, for this paper uh, and for previous papers is Rosalind Cholo, who couldn't be here. I think it's 4 a.m. in the morning where she is in, in South and uh, in Botswana. Uh, so, uh, uh, so this is joint work with her. Uh, and um, what we want to do here is to try and show how this uh, uh, relationship, this uh, uh, syntactic relationship between the agreeing complementizer of what it agrees with and uh, what, what kinds of things influence whether or not that agreement takes place, uh, how we can put that into uh, uh, terms that uh, respect locality domains that are familiar from other work in syntax. Uh, so it, it presents a kind of a puzzle. And that's what we're going to try and solve here, uh, or at least suggest the direction that has to be taken in order to get it solved. Now, the most uh, dis striking thing about the concept of complementizers uh, in uh, both of the languages I'll talk mostly about, which is uh, Ikalanga and uh, Setswana, both spoken in Botswana, uh, is that the complementizer is uh, the root of it, is the same root as the uh, verb meaning say. And this is very common across the world's languages that uh, complementizers or sets of complementizers in a particular language might have the same uh, verb, uh, same root as the verb meaning say. That's, uh, and uh, much has been made of this in terms of grammaticalization theories and so forth. And there's a, a very interesting recent uh, dissertation by uh, Travis Major, uh, who explores this and argues that these things are much more verb-like than I will claim they are. Um, but um, it is important to say about say, uh, whether or not it's actually verbal in this, uh, in a particular uh, situation. The reason that this comes up is because you see agreement on these things. Well, we see agreement on verbs. So why wouldn't uh, this, why, why not analyze this as some kind of a, a light verb, okay? Uh, and so that's the first question I'm going to address. I want to identify um, whether or not uh, we're talking about an actual complementizer as opposed to a verb, or at least what are the criteria for deciding that matter. Uh, and then I'll turn to uh, what the locality relations are uh, and uh, some of the consequences for the uh, causal architecture that we have to assume, not just for uh, Setswana, uh, but uh, some of the issues arise that don't probably have much more general uh, import in syntactic theory. All right, so let's start out uh, by looking at these uh, complementizers in a little more detail, at least the one in. Uh, uh, Setswana. So the root here uh, of the that it's of the verb and of the complementizer is re, and re is corresponds to the verb say in this language and is used that way, as you'll see. Um, there's two complementizers that have this re root in them. One of them is uh, the one that agrees with whatever the subject of the superordinate clause is, uh, and now I'm calling that agar re. Okay, and the other one is gore, which is probably uh, uh, put together between re and the, um, uh, the infinitival marker, or uh, uh, it could be thought of as a noun class marker. Now, if you are familiar with Bantu languages, you know that Bantu languages have a very rich noun class system. Uh, so uh, across Bantu, there may be 25 of these in any given language. You have something between 
12 and 22 are, uh, of these classes are tested and they're cognates, uh, uh, which is the numbering system that we have in, in Bantu uh, reflects those cognate relations typically. Um, the organization of the noun classes according to that uh, uh, classification is that uh, the first 10 classes are quite common uh, across um, across Bantu and uh, the odd numbers are singular noun class members uh, and the uh, even numbers from first 10 are uh, plural noun class members. And so, uh, so one human is class one, two humans is class two, uh, I don't know, three uh, uh, baboons and I don't know, say uh, some of these languages baboons are classified class eight. And if you had you know, one baboon, it's class seven, two, two baboons, class two or more baboons, class eight. So um, all of the agreement morphology depends on these noun class relations. And that's why I mentioned them because we're gonna be looking at agreement. We're gonna see these kinds of uh, uh, concordances uh, between uh, what the subject marker is, for example, for the verb in the superordinate clause and what the marking is on the complementizer of the complement clause that corresponds to, uh, it's in the agreement relation. All right, so uh, the first uh, uh, two examples here just simply show uh, the neutral complementizer, the one that simply has the uh, uh, infinitival type marker uh, with re, uh, score, score, okay. Uh, and that is sort of like the vanilla complementizer in this language uh, for the most part, okay. Um, and, uh, we mostly are interested in this one by contrast. Uh, what we're most mostly going to be focusing on uh, is the uh, uh, agar ray uh, uh, complementizer, and you see it there in two a. So uh, I've made um, uh, SM stands for sub subject marker, in case you need to know, and the C one that's class one, or C ten is class ten, and so on, uh, in the glosses. Okay, so in two, uh, we have uh, Neo told Thuto that he should buy a car. Um, and uh, in that kind of a, a situation, the subject Neo gets the uh, subject marker for class one. And we see also the subject marker for class one on the uh, complementizer that, okay. Uh, and uh, I'm calling it a complementizer right now, but we're still, it's an open question as to whether or not these things are somehow like verbs. What you can see in 2B is that if the, uh, um, the uh, subject is plural, uh, so that's the associative marker bo, uh, so that's a uh, bo-neo means neo and others, okay? So that'll have the plural human, therefore be class two, that would be ba. And uh, you see ba on the verb, and you also see ba on the complementizer. You might also notice that the verb here, which is uh, rendered as tell, is actually the same verb as the complementizer, Ray. Um, that's because when uh, Ray takes a direct object, it has the interpretation tell. And in that situation, it has to have the associative, uh, uh, sorry, it has to have the, um, uh, the agreeing complementizer. We'll come back to that. Okay. Uh, now, sometimes people translate uh, uh, one of those sentences there as uh, Neo and others, like the, the one with the, the, the class two agreement, Neo and others told Thudo uh, saying he should buy a car. Okay, so they render that, uh, what I'm calling a complementizer, almost like it's a verb, you know, so like uh, an adjunct kind of thing. And we'll see that that's probably not the right analysis, but um, there's a reason that people uh, render this that way in some translations, okay. Um, so uh, uh, when you have uh, the verb say, when it just means say, then also you're not allowed to have that complementizer present. And that would seem to suggest right away, well, make this thing is just a verb, okay. Uh, that is what people uh, have sometimes argued, okay. So you see in 3a that you have no complementizer other than the verb that says, that say, okay. Uh, whereas in the second one, if you try to stick in either of those complementizers, it's bad, okay. So, and uh, if you're thinking about it as well, you'd be repeating the verb, uh, well, you don't do that. So, um, so this is uh, some of the evidence that what we're dealing with is a verb. And certainly I would agree that it, it, uh, are is acting as a verb in 3A. So the claim is not that this thing is never a verb. The claim is that it's part of its distribution 
is uh, as a complementizer. Okay. Now, uh, on the other hand, again, this is the, again the reason that some people think of these things as verbs is because the full range of agreement uh, that we see um, uh, on verbs uh, also appears for five features and person on these complementizers. And so you just have examples there from four. Uh, a through E uh, showing this, and I, I won't go through them. Uh, now, when that verb does require a, a direct object, though, that's to say the verb re, uh, then all of a sudden it, it requires this uh, uh, complementizer. Um, and uh, well, there's a sort of a subtle contrast here, I don't know if it's worth going through. Uh, in 4E versus 4F, I heard the donkey saying to them to uh, go away, okay? Uh, in uh, 4E, we have the full verb saying, you see that it's got an object marker on it and uh, uh, FV, by the way, is final vowel, which is just a, a, a phonological thing that uh, has to happen to fill out uh, a Bantu verb. Um, so you don't have to pay attention to that. Uh, but uh, you can see that the uh, uh, I is, uh, uh, the subject marker for I is on the, the matrix verb. Uh, and then there's an intermediate verb, right? Uh, which is uh, to the verb uh, say, okay? But the subject of that is donkey, okay? So that's why it's, uh, the subject marker is 10 on that. And then you see the subject, uh, the same uh, uh, C10 on the complementizer, okay? Uh, whereas if you look at um, uh, for F, it's acting as a verb in that situation. Uh, and uh, uh, you can tell that because you don't have uh, the doubling, right? So in 4E, you see the ray here and the D-ray there. Here you just see the D-ray. So it's acting just as, as the verb. So you get these very close uh, comparisons. Um, I'm going to skip over that. So what we've said so far uh, uh, suggests that these things are verb-like, uh, but um, I think you can show that it can't always be analyzed as a verb, and there are uh, uh, clear cases. So in A there, when Agare uh, introduces a complement clause following the uh, uh, immediate superordinate clause verb, okay, it can't be re reflected for tense, and it can't have an object mark which is typical of all other uh, verbal, uh, uh, all other verbs in the language, okay? Uh, if they can, if they take objects, they can take object markers, uh, and presumably they can get things like applicative atta attached to them, which you also can't get on these things. Um, so uh, they don't act like other verb stems in this respect. Uh, they're, they're impoverished. Uh, another uh, striking fact about them is that the verbs that take this kind of complementizer, what I'm taking to be a complementizer, um, selected uh, uh, idiosyncratically. They're all verbs of saying, okay? Uh, and so that part seems to make sense. But uh, there are verbs of saying that don't take this complementizer, the agreeing complementizers, uh, and, uh, uh, and simply can't do it. Uh, and there are some verbs of saying uh, that you might expect would take this, this complementizer and can't. Uh, others absolutely must, they can't have any other complementizer. Uh, and so uh, while there aren't a lot of examples uh, that actually take this kind of agreement, there's only uh, seven verbs there, I think, or eight verbs. Um, the, uh, the way that the agreement works is uh, consistent for all of those verbs, right? So this is a small, small class and it looks like there has to be kind of lexical selection involved, all right? And you don't expect lexical selection for verbs as your complements. You get lexical selection for complementizers. That's, that's a much more common thing. And so this suggests again, that these are actually complementizers. So there's morphological impoverishment and idiosyncratic selection, okay? Um, let's see, uh, this is just, uh, uh, these examples simply show a bunch of cases of these different verbs. Uh, behaving as, as described. Uh, for uh, 6A and 6B, that's a contrast in blue. Uh, that, that's my way of showing that I'm talking about Ikalanga, so you don't get confused. Uh, and as usual, the red shows the complementizer or the interesting, the interesting thing that we want to talk about. Uh, and 6A is, is Setswana, okay? 
and uh, you have a verb for ask, which is a verb of saying, okay? And you can't get the agreeing complementizer. Uh, just looking uh, uh, across to uh, Ikalanga, which is a neighboring language, um, the uh, verb meaning ask, okay, um, does take an agreeing complementizer. Right? And an agreement is much richer in uh, Ikalanga, but also limited to a certain class of verbs uh, that uh, uh, seems idiosyncratic. Okay, so the, uh, the fact that this um, particular kind of verb, which is a verb of saying, doesn't take the agreeing complementizer is, uh, doesn't follow from anything, right? It's, it looks like something that we're stuck with until we have a better theory. Okay, we'll also notice that the um, Ikalanga uh, agreement is much richer, okay? Uh, T is the, uh, uh, the say root uh, that forms the complementizer. Uh, the chi actually uh, is a tense marker, uh, but it's only possible for uh, one of the past tenses in, in Nikolanga. Uh, otherwise, you don't see it. Um, and then there's the uh, uh, what corresponds to the subject uh, uh, subject marking first class in that language. Uh, so it's marked for both tense and, uh, uh, and what we might call five features. Okay. All right, so uh, then we have this other verb meaning tell. It's about three verbs that get translated in English as tell. I'm still trying to figure out what their subtle semantic differences are. So if you ask me, I don't have an answer to that, uh, <clears throat> but it's on the agenda. Uh, and so for that particular case, uh, you can see that uh, we have uh, with this verb, the ability to have the agreeing complementizer, but we can't get the vanilla complementizer. Right? And I don't know why that's so for this verb. And it's not clear that should, that should have an explanation other than lexical learning, but we don't know yet. Okay. Um, I've already mentioned this, that the verb ray, when it, uh, when it acts like a verb, uh, uh, doesn't take a complementizer unless it has a direct object. Okay. I'm just going to skip over that. Uh, now, here's a very important point, uh, which uh, is a little more subtle than I think I'd put it here. Uh, Agare is not possible uh, in contexts where agreement is not possible or not local, okay? So uh, this complementizer is very picky about what it can agree with. It won't agree with any direct object, okay? Um, and it won't agree with any subject that's higher than the next one up, right? So the immediate superordinate subject is as far as it can go in looking for an antecedent. So it's local in that sense. Um, there's a more subtle point here about infinitives I'm going to skip over. Um, well, uh, I'll mention it very briefly. Uh, in Ikalanga, okay, you see a complementizer there, a yi, okay, which is in, uh, in red on 10b. Uh, that yi is the passive form of the root for say, uh, and uh, it's combined with the uh, subject marker for a first, uh, uh, first class. And um, that uh, is a situation where the intervening verb was, normally takes this kind of complementizer, but it's an infinitive, right? And so its subject is missing. It's a control situation. Neo is the controller of the subject of uh, Kubudzma, okay? Uh, and it, it seems that that's close enough for uh, the complementizer complement of Buds to take the first class agreement, okay? That is not possible. Um, uh, similar uh, configuration does not yield agreement in Sitswana. So this is one difference between the languages that's of interest. And what seems to be going on is that, well, first of all, uh, what, what it shows for Ikalanga is that the agreement is not between the subject marker and the, uh, um, and the, and the complementizer. It's between the actual subject and the complementizer because there is no subject marker other than ku, uh, which is the infinitival marker in, uh, uh, in 10b, okay? Um, you simply get nothing uh, to agree with in uh, uh, Setswana, it simply fails. So that's something that needs a little bit more explanation, but it also shows how delicate the agreement relation is, 
but just how local can it be? It's a little, uh, uh, you have chaining in uh, Ikalanga, but not in Sitswana. But it seems to be about locality, uh, not about the local verbs, which particular verb it is. It's the fact that infinitive is intervening, okay? Uh, and so there's another kind of locality effect, and that's why it's there uh, in this section of the discussion. And another kind of case where you don't see um, uh, the agreeing complementizer is a sentential subjects. Now, uh, you can see that the, um, uh, uh, let's see, surprise, it doesn't show that. Uh, 11B shows uh, uh, the agreement. Um, so we have uh, that Pluto arrived late. Now that's going to get the uh, uh, class 15 because that's the uh, homophonous uh, with the uh, uh, infinitive marker. Some people just say they're the same thing. Um, and so that's what it agrees with on the matrix verb there. Okay. Uh, so it looks like that thing's a subject because typically you, know, you, you might assume that it's dislocated, but even, whether it's a subject or it's dislocated, uh, it doesn't really matter because Gore in either case would not be in a position uh, to agree with anything in the, in the higher subject. And so you can't get Agore there, you only get Gore. Right? So this is predictable if we assume that these things are complementizers. Okay, so uh, conclusion so far, right? Agore is agreeing, uh, uh, is an agreeing C in at least a portion of its distribution. Its morphology is impoverished by comparison with main verb re. Uh, the verbs that like license agre are lexically is, uh, in so idiosyncratic. Um, and uh, it would be semantically redundant with most of the verbs of saying. Uh, and uh, so those are all reasons why it looks like a complementizer. An additional reason is that the way it behaves as it's something that agrees uh, in ways that uh, uh, verbs don't seem to be limited. Um, so it must agree with the subject. It can't skip an intervening verb or subject. It cannot be in a position where it has no supermanding antecedent. And uh, controlled subjects are not adequate to be uh, local, uh, at least for in Setswana for Agrave. Okay. All right, so now I'm gonna take a kind of a turn here uh, and start talking about more structural questions rather than just empirical separating uh, sheep from goats. Um, and uh, what I'm interested in is the uh, architecture of the clause and how it's going to be, how it's going to play out here. Uh, so uh, the digression, I'm going to talk about WH extraction, okay, and we'll see why in a minute. Um, now it's possible to extract out of both a Gore clause or an Agore clause, which indicates that they are complement the clauses and not, say, uh, adjuncts, one would assume, at least uh, in part of their derivation. Uh, and a uh, particular example I have here is a relative clause where the extraction has been uh, uh, from the object position of the uh, lower clause. Um, so it's the car that uh, others told Neo that he should buy is very new, okay? Um, and so uh, you'll notice that um, the WH phrase doesn't appear anywhere here. Right? Uh, basically in relative clauses, if there's a relative operator, it's silent. But one of the reasons that you know that you're dealing with a relative clause is because of that verb, bare uh, ile, I don't know how to say it. Um, uh, it has at the end there a, a relative marker on the verb, okay? And you see those relative markers are for every verb uh, that's between the extraction point, uh, between the clause that has the extraction point and wherever it lands. So everything in between that will have this uh, relative marker on the verb. So it's a kind of success and cyclicity kind of uh, uh, fact. And uh, when you have WH in situ, uh, when it's truly WH in situ, you don't see that. So it's an interesting uh, uh, thing that Rose has written about, uh, some detail. Uh, okay, uh, under our usual assumptions about WH, moment the WH phrase passes through intermediate comps uh, or CPs, on its way to its final spec CP, okay. In minimalist reasoning, as I've just mentioned, object extraction was first to adjoin to VP, or little VP, uh, because little VP is an intervening phase and then it moves up to spec CP, okay. Uh, and so you have this cyclic movement is going phase to phase where uh, CP is a phase and little VP is a phase 
which means that you move to the edge of a particular locality domain. The very edge of that domain is visible to the next domain, and you can use and you know, pull it out of that uh, uh, the edge position and move it up to the edge of your higher domain and keep handing it up in these escape hatches through the edges until you get to the top. And this is uh, uh, the uh, the way that cyclicity is done in modern minimalist theory. Uh, so uh, what it means, though, if you're able to see something in the edge of the cycle that's below you. Uh, that if you want to move something any further than the cycle below you, you've got to be able to see it, right? It, it can't be dis it can't be uh, hidden. And the uh, idea of the phase impenetrability condition of Chomsky's uh, is that um, you only can see into the edge, and uh, below that, you you've lost your opportunity to uh, to see anything. And so if you're doing WH movement, you move it from uh, some position in, in phase one to the edge of phase one. And then the next phase, phase two, can see the edge of phase one and say, oh, okay, I want that guy and move him up to the higher edge. Okay. So that's the way that uh, cyclicity is done in, in modern minimalist theory. Um, so that means that the uh, spec CP of the complement clause, which is a landing site for WH movement, uh, must be in a locality relation to the edge of little vp, since that's the edge of the next phase it has to get to. Uh, and so uh, there should be an intermediate movement that stops in vp, a uh, little vp adjoining position. Now, if you're not used to little vp, big vp, I um, want to gloss over that for now and come back to it, because I'm not going to use little vp a little later, I'm going to use something else. Um, so, uh, but the usual assumption about <clears throat> little vp is that a big V is basically just a root, okay? And a uh, uh, little V makes it verbal, okay? That's then if it, if it used an N, it would make take the same root and make it a nominal, okay? That's, that's sort of the reasoning about these things. Uh, but little VP also had a number of other functions uh, in uh, recent minimalist theory over the last 20 or 25 years. It's uh, sometimes it's seen as the source of accusative case assignment, sometimes it's seen, uh, uh, as uh, the thing that introduces the external argument, which I write as EA here, okay? Uh, and uh, let's assume that it does that. And if so, uh, since the external argument's originating in little VP and must end up in spec TP, if there's, that's gonna be a movement, then T has to see into um, the phase below it, at least to the edge. So uh, if the external argument originates in spec little VP, it has to be visible to T, therefore uh, the edge of little VP must um, include the external argument so that it can be seen at the next phase, right? So um, that's the, uh, the reasoning about these things, okay? Uh, all right, so I have a diagram here and just can't quite fit the whole thing in, but the idea would be, uh, this sort of gives you a situation where you've done say a uh, 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 WH extraction to the edge of this CP domain here, okay? Well, where's the edge? Well, I, the way I've set it up, I have array here and I have Q particle here. That's what that is, Q particle, because it's like a question particle. And you actually, it's, a, it's an actual morphological thing. You can see it, it's ah. Um, and I set it up so that agar, agar ray is higher than the Q particle, All right? Now this is important because if the Q, if the, uh, this position here is the escape hatch for WH movement, then it's gotta be visible to, uh, in the little V cycle. Uh, oops, let me do that, let me do this. Uh, on a little V cycle, it has to be able to look to this position Here's the little v side, and it has to, this would have to, if passing through little vp, it's gonna to have to adjoin to it, to this position before it goes up to the top, to this position. That should have an index i on it, okay? Um, so um, that leaves us with a kind of a, a puzzle, right? If, if I do it this way, then this agare, okay, is in the same domain as the external argument here. Remember we said for Ikalanga, that this thing is sensitive to the subject of the next higher phase, but this is up to the subject of T, 
but it originates in uh, in this position, th. Okay, that's where the uh, specifier of the v. So that's within the same phase as this and can be in an agreement relation with it. It moves out later in the next phase to get up to spec TP for whatever reason, EPP or whatever you like. Okay. So now the question is, why would I put things this way, having the uh, aggregate array above the Q particle? Well, that simply reflects the word order of these things. Okay. Uh, the Q particle occurs in matrix clauses when you have a yes, no question. Is Neo sleeping? You get this ah in the beginning. Um, again, I apologize for the absence of uh, uh, tone marking. Uh, Rose is supposed to get around to it soon. Um, and uh, here we also see that when you have a clause, uh, a complement clause, this is the verb ask again, okay? It takes glory as its complementizer and the Q particle follows that, okay? So uh, the structure that I have here reflects that, that difference, okay? Um, okay, uh, we see the same thing in, uh, in Nicolanga. Again, we have the agreeing complementizer here, or you could have the non-agreeing one, which they also have in uh, Nicolanga. And uh, in both cases, the Q particle comes after, okay? Uh, and so uh, it looks like that, that piece of structure that I presented here at the left periphery of the subordinate clause requires that this be lower than that. That has certain consequences when we come to, okay? Okay, uh, those of you who are, know about Ritzi's uh, left periphery ideas might uh, assign to these positions a certain uh, uh, parallels to what we see in other languages. Uh, so you might call Q par the Q particle head might be a force head or something like that, but I'm not gonna go into those details because it's not uh, immediately relevant to what I wanna say here. Um, I'm mostly concerned with the fact that CP is normally thought of as the highest extended projection of the complement clause. I mean, that's when you say, okay, what's, what's the chunk that's the complement clause? You say, well, it's a CP, okay? Um, but the, it looks like the Q particle has to be the phase head. Now, what do I say that? I say that because if it's not the phase head, if the CP is the phase head, then when we move WH, uh, uh, WH phrases into the specifier position of uh, uh, Q particle phrase, okay, it's not visible to the next cycle up because it's below the phase head, which if we assumed it was C, okay, it, that, that's not in the edge. Okay, the WH phrase wouldn't be in the edge. So in order for the WH phrase to be in the edge, it has to be in the specifier Q particle phrase. Okay, uh, it would be weird to put it into the, to move it to the specifier position of, uh, of agri C because it doesn't agree with that. Okay, uh, it seems to to overlook any kind of WH movement move through it. Doesn't seem to pay any attention to it. And that would make sense if it was its specifier position was never filled by the WH phrase. Okay, so the WH phrase is passing through not the highest functional projection of clauses. It's passing through a lower functional projection that uh, is the phase edge. And that means that the C above that is going to be part of uh, visible to the next phase above because it's not, it's not even in the edge of the lower phase, it's, it's, it's fully in the higher phase. Okay, and that's good because you want it to be able to agree. Okay. So uh, now we're getting into what, what's the edge of the phase or the locality domain that uh, Agarray agrees. This is about whether or not it's the um, uh, VP internal subject that the uh, complementizer is agreeing with, or it's agreeing with some functional projection that agrees with that subject, okay? Now, in some of these languages, uh, it looks like we might have to do something uh, intermediate, let's see. Uh, well, so T ultimately agrees with uh, the external argument, okay? Uh, that's to say the thing generated in spec little VP, the subject of the transitive curve. It's gonna agree with that. Uh, and uh, so those things have to be uh, uh, visible within the same phase. And that'll be true if, as long as the uh, spec VP is, uh, uh, is on the edge uh, uh, so that the, the next cycle above it can see it, okay? Uh, so uh, 
what we want to ask though, is Agare agreeing uh, with an argument or is it agreeing with a head? The advantage of saying that it agrees with the head is that we would like to have it turn out that it follows there's no agreement with the direct object, right? Remember we said these things always, these uh, green complementizers have to be, uh, find the, uh, uh, the subject of the clause, right? That's the thing they agree with. But although they agree with the subject of the clause, um, there's a sense in which uh, they have to uh, uh, avoid the object. If they were just agreeing with the C commanding DP, the object would, in many cases would be the better candidate. Okay, and that's never possible. If, however, what the uh, complementizer is agreeing with is some higher head that agrees in turn with the subject, and it's always that thing, that, that head that it has to agree with, if that head is high enough, it'll be beyond the object. And so if it's agreeing with little v, then it would have uh, only the subject as its potential antecedent because the subject would agree with little v, little v would agree with the complementizer. Uh, and so that's a kind of mediated agreement would get the subject orientation of these things, okay? Now the question is, well, is it little v or is it something else, okay? And that's what this section's about and I'm gonna have to go fairly quickly over it. The basic claim is that it's actually voice p that it's agreeing with and that the external argument is not introduced in little v, uh, but in, uh, in, in the spec of voice p. Now this is a, a position that's been argued by a number of other people. Uh, in, in uh, Heidi Harley in particular, and also in uh, work by Hazel Mitchell, Mitchley that's forth, forthcoming. Um, and uh, the claim is not that there isn't a little VP, but rather a little VP is not where the external argument is introduced. So we're breaking up the, some of the responsibilities that used to be assigned to little VP. Uh, the verbalizing uh, uh, nature of little V is the main thing that it does in the position where it is. Above that is the voice marker, which is its own head. And in uh, most Bantu languages, this is a very uh, familiar morpheme. Uh, it's high in the verb stem uh, based on its distance from the root uh, by comparison with other affixes that can come between it. Um, uh, and uh, that suggests that it's uh, above the little b, okay? Uh, so the uh, kind of uh, structure we have in mind is something like this, okay? Where instead of saying that little vp is the phase edge, it's, little, it's uh, voice p that's the phase edge, and that's the phase uh, head, okay? So there's, there's voices, and uh, if you're doing wh movement, that means you're adjoining to this voice phrase, okay? Um, but what it also means, uh, oops, is that um, the C here is local to voice, right? Now the question is, why should we say that it's, it's more important that it be local to voice than local to, to B or little B or anything else? Well, that's because what we seem to know uh, from um, uh, Ikalanga is that um, there seems to be agreement between voice in the main clause and voice on the complementizer. Both in Ikilanga and in Setswana, there is a suppletion for the, pass, for the passive form of the verb to say, okay? Uh, and uh, in, uh, in Ikilanga, it's, it goes from T to Y. And uh, uh, for uh, 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 Setswana, it goes from Ri uh, to Twe, okay? Uh, and that difference uh, looks like, well, again, it looks like verb type behavior, but it, it turns out that there's a, a correspondence, especially in Ikalanga, that if the main uh, clause verb is uh, uh, passivized, then you can get the passive form of the uh, complementizer. And for a certain small set of verbs for speakers who are, tend to be older, uh, you get also uh, phi agreement on these things. So you get both agreement and uh, uh, concordance with passive in the matrix clause, which suggests that there's a direct relationship between voice and agreement between the voice uh, uh, morpheme in the in immediately superordinate clause and uh, the shape of the complementizer and the complement clause complement, okay? 
complementizable. Uh, so uh, if that's true, then we have, again, uh, uh, but I have to argue that Gottwitz is a complementizer. I don't have time for that. I'll just simply say it's so. Um, and, but I can go into the uh, motivations for it. Uh, and so we'll be able to tell the difference between got away the verb and got away the C. You can show that they're, that they're different. Uh, where, where one of the interesting things that you can say is that uh, where you can show that got away is a, is a infinitival verb, for example, you know, to be told or something like that. Um, in that instance, it could uh, uh, have a pro subject. And, uh, uh, but if it were a complementizer, in those uh, certain environments where it's treated as a complementizer, if it had a pro subject, it would be uh, impossible. Because one of the things we know about pro is that it can't be expletive, okay? So if you look at 16a from uh, English, for it to be said that John is guilty would be surprising, uh, but you can't say to be said that John is guilty would be surprising. Uh, you can't have an expletive uh, uh, in a position where pro would be. As in Godway seems to have uh, uh, interpretation that would have that. So for example, if you see uh, 15C were translated, see, let me show you 15C. Uh, if 15C were translated, Thudo was told that it was said that he should buy a car, then uh, since there is no it present there, it would presumably have to be uh, it's the infinitival form for say, that would have to be a pro, therefore it would have to be an expletive, therefore it shouldn't exist, okay? If it's a complementizer, we have no commitment. Uh, to there being a pro subject. Right? So that's the reason that we think the gut way is a, a, a complementizer and not a verb in these contexts. Um, okay, now there's a certain evidential uses of this. I have to skip over that because there isn't time, but I'm happy to talk about it. Um, so uh, I've already mentioned this uh, fact about Ikalanga namely that you have this concordance between the shape of the complementizer and the shape of the, uh, uh, and the voice marker and the matrix clause. And we see it also in Setswana, but in Setswana, it's harder to show that um, there's a concordance relation because there is a, a widespread use of, especially Gautwe, the uh, passive complementizer uh, to, uh, for evidential effect, meaning I distance myself from, from from whether or not this is true, okay, it's said, you know, kind of thing. People say that, but you know. Um, all right, so I'm just going to come to the main conclusion so far, which is so far as we'll get, and uh, it's that agarae is an agreeing complementizer that uh, occurs, uh, oops, uh, with a lexically restricted subset uh, of verbs of saying. Agarae must have an agreement partner locally, either the voice head or the uh, external argument, and I've argued that it's actually the voice head. Um, uh, the voice mediates agreement between T and agare, accounting for subject orientation, uh, er, uh, the subject orientation of agare. Uh, agare, Godwe, and Gore are all higher than the question particle A. Ah. Didn't show this in detail, but I only showed it for Gore. Um, and I can't show it for agare, but I can show it for Godwe, I believe. Uh, and for all three of those in uh, Ikalanga, the corresponding complementizers, you can show it's higher than the particle that, uh, uh -huh. uh, And so on the basis of extraction and C selection evidence, we can determine that the uh, question specifier is, uh, is the landing site for WH movement. The uh, projection is the boundary of the complement clause phase. And the complement clause outermost head is C, okay? And yet C is the outermost extended projection of the complement clause. Uh, the general point here is that it's usually assumed that a phase head is always the outermost head on the spine of functional projections. This is a very common assumption, uh, often not stated, uh, almost never stated in fact. However, our conclusion about agar uh, C in CP is not consistent with this assumption. Agar C is outside the phase edge uh, and part of the higher phase, right? Um, and this raises questions of the same sort about voice P. Why should voice P be the, uh, uh, seen as the edge of the uh, verbal projection? Uh, there, above it, there's things like aspect and mood and so on. If we think about the projection, uh, the extended projection of the verb, there's no reason to stop at voice P unless it just happens to be that that's where the phase edge is, OK? 
Okay, so this conversation really is something that could be uh, extended to talk about uh, these other kinds of uh, uh, arguments for where the phase head is supposed to be. All right, so uh, I'm gonna have to stop there. Um, and uh, there are other things I could talk about, time four, uh, part four, but uh, I don't think I'll get to that unless there are questions about it. Um, so I'll have to stop there, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, now it's uh, time for question and comments or answer. No, answer will be by Ken. So, <laughs> so comments and questions. I mean, if you don't ask me questions, I'm just going to eat. So. Yes. <laughs> Watch me eat. Yeah, while people are getting their thoughts, gathering their thoughts. Yeah, yeah I can wait a few minutes. So people think yeah. About, mm -hmm. I want to ask something in particular. Sorry if that went too fast. <laughs> so maybe this is not, uh, I have a question, but it's not based on data of Bantu languages, but uh, there are some other languages that have a green relative clause marker based on the number of the head now. Uh, would uh, those kind of languages also if we probe properly, uh, also may show this kind of properties actually, because uh... well, that's it's a very complicated thing to answer. Because, right. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two analyses of relative clauses: one is a promotion analysis, and one is a matching analysis. The um, matching analysis is you move a WH operator to the, the edge of a clause, and then that clause is related to the head head uh, nucleus of the relative clause you know, the boy who Mary saw or something like that, the who is there. Uh, and the question is, well, have you moved who from a lower position, you stop and inspect CP and then you relate it by some kind of predication. The other analysis is to say that the, uh, the you, you're basically moving who, who boy up to the front and then you move boy out of who. And it, uh, all of this is a complement to um, the determiner the Mm -hmm. You get the boy who and so on. That's the promotion analysis. Mm -hmm. So depending on which of those analyses you assume, um, it's not clear that uh, which of these, whether these kinds of agreement or concordance relations I'm talking about would come into play. Presumably it would have to come into play with the, uh, uh, the matching analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, but even under that situation, there's a, a number of kinds of complications that I can think of one kind of thing where it might come up. I mean, uh, when you get heavy pipe piping in a row clause, uh, and Ross's old example, uh, the reports the uh, height of the lettering on the covers of which the government prescribes, right? So for heavy pipe piping, you get this in uh, in some languages. Uh, Italian has very heavy pipe piping too. Uh, and so the the height of the lettering on the reports of which, that whole thing has been Pipe pipe to the front of the relative clause just below the head, the reports, okay, which corresponds to the reports. Now, the question is, how do you get which to, to be the thing that uh, is predicated uh, of the reports, right? So that you, get, you relate the relative clause to the head. The distance between the relative clause nucleus and that which uh, is limited in certain ways. And there could be agreement relations that determine that that might be similar to those that are involved here. Mm -hmm. That's the closest I could think of with respect to relative clauses. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as far as I can tell, it's not about, uh, one would have to, uh, there might be relationships you could find uh, in nominals that take complement clauses. Mm -hmm. So far as I know, uh, in Ikalanga, you don't get those kinds of uh, agreement effects on complementizers that are nouns like the fact that John was guilty. You get different complementizers. Oh, you don't get agreement on those complementizers? No, I mean, well, a lot of them are fact-driven, so 
Mm -hmm. uh, this is neither of these conformatizers is used for the fact of mm -hmm. uh, neither Gore nor uh, uh, Agrar. So it, a, a lot of it depends on uh, whether we're talking about a complementation configuration. Mm -hmm. So a relative clause configuration is a different kind of, of animal in this way. Right. Although there are people who are arguing very recently that complement clauses really should be analyzed as relative clauses, and Enoch Abo was one of them. Um, but uh, I think that you have to do a certain amount of uh, uh, gymnastics to make that so uh, for the syntax. And uh, a similar uh, line has been pursued by uh, Keir Moulton in some very uh, influential work recently. Mm -hmm. uh, but his way of doing it is a little bit less, uh, uh, less like a relative clause and more like a mm, semantic solution. Um, Mm -hmm. where the uh, clause is an adjunct to some null n head, which is the actual uh, complement of the verb. It doesn't work terribly well for things like, you know, it's obvious that John is guilty. If that John is guilty is a noun, then it really doesn't make much sense because you can't get nouns after it's obvious. You know, it's obvious the guilt of John. Um, so uh, there are problems with that way of trying to do it. Mm -hmm. So in any case, I think that uh, in terms of uh, the phenomenon we're looking at is basically either in some adjunct clauses, uh, not in these languages, but in some mm -hmm. adjunct clauses, uh, but primarily it's a phenomenon of complement clauses. Mm -hmm. At least, you know, we don't know enough. I mean, right now we only know about the African cases, it just haven't been, hasn't, haven't been much, uh, much work on things outside of Africa that show this pattern. Claire, do you know of any uh, uh, languages that show the uh, C agreement effects uh, with superordinate subjects outside of Africa? Um, I, the, what does Dutch do? Well, Dutch has agrees with the lower subject. Right? Okay, right. So Dutch is the lower. No, I think it is just African languages. Then. Yeah. Um, one, just with your previous point, the noun complement clauses, at least in a lot of Bantu, uh, you get associative marking like they look like they're you know possessed kind of uh, by the head noun and um so it's like a totally yeah. different strategy and my impression yeah. is that a green complement or a green complementizers are just allergic to combining with associative but some other complementizers can can do it um, yeah that's probably true right? <clears throat> actually we have a question on the uh, chat and uh, let me just read it uh, uh, it's by Takashi Munakata, uh, and he's wondering why this t kind of agreement uh, is limited to certain verbs. And he says, for example, the C drops, uh, C drops uh, are observed only s with the verbs say and think in Kansai Japanese. That's uh, around Osaka. And uh, Saito 1986 reports that. Do you have any comments? <laughs> Well, I mean, one of the areas that, um, I mean, there, there's been an attempt in recent years to try and reduce C selection, you know, constituent selection or syntactic selection as much as possible in favor of semantic selection. So as to uncomplicate the learning process. So if you simply know what something means and you have an alignment with a certain kind of uh, 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 clause type, then you would know for uh, on the basis of what a verb means, what kinds of clauses would go with it. Uh, and the sticking point for that are cases like the one uh, just mentioned, where it looks like particular verbs, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, have something to say about what their, uh, the edge of the clause looks like uh, below them. And um, if it's so, it's, it's the, we get to the unfortunate conclusion that we still need a certain amount of uh, uh, selection for uh, uh, lexical heads by higher uh, elements. And so, the difficult cases are precisely those where uh, you have no clear semantic generalization mm -hmm. that you can appeal to, to isolate the cases uh, where the, uh, the periphery of the complement clause has to act differently for one verb as opposed to another. Uh, it would be great if we had a, a better story about that. And who knows, a finer grained semantics may slowly disentangle some of these uh, odd selectional facts where you might be looking at something that's only two or three verbs in one language, but you'd see the same pattern in every other language you looked at, again, for the same you know, three verbs. Um, 
I mean, you do see things like that, you know, uh, if you're going to have uh, inherent uh, uh, reflexives, the kinds of verbs that are inherently reflexive cross-linguistically are typically verbs of body position or, uh, you know, uh, bodily function or grooming uh, and not other things like praising, okay? Um, so, um, but that only narrows the field. Uh, so in other words, even in these languages where you have uh, inherent reflexives for some verbs, other verbs that seem to be in the same kind of class don't allow it. And it's not uh, at all obvious why there should be those differences. So in other words, you, you can suspect based on what something means that's going to have a peculiar lexical selection, but you can't be sure uh, you have to have the you know, the experience to say, oh, okay, they're, they're going to do that that way. Well, I, you know, I thought that might be so, but I wasn't sure. And as a kid, then you just you say, okay, now I know, now I know what that means, you know, how to use that verb. But uh, uh, I, I, this is a real, it's a sticking point. And uh, I keep hoping that we'll get, uh, you know, finer semantic distinctions that will reduce the role of lexical selection because it's a greater burden on learning. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also requires, uh, you know, the, uh, a little bit more syntax uh, uh, than one would hope in a minimalist theory one would have to appeal to. Uh, so yeah, that's the best answer I can give for that, but I, <laughs> which is no answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for that. And, uh, uh, oh, uh, Munakata-san, do you have? Uh, uh, thank you very much. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. oh okay he was just thinking so uh thank you and i think that's uh, our time for ken's talk let's uh thank you one more time and let's also stop the recording briefly